So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and kind of... Do I talk to you the whole time? Yeah. I don't... Okay. Um, I'm Karen Katowski, a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, and I spent my last uh, four and a half years of 20 in the Pentagon, and my last uh, almost a year working in the uh, office of Near East South Asia. And that's where I... Uh, Near East South Asia is the, like the Middle East policy, Office of Secretary of Defense policy uh, for the Middle East region. And that's where I really, in that final year of my, of my service, uh, is where I was really exposed to some of the uh, things that I've been speaking out about uh, since I've retired. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Um, how, how much? Um, so let's start off here. Let's see, we're going to start off with all this stuff. Okay. So uh, at what point did you kind of realize that something was seriously wrong with what was happening in this environment? Um, I, w I was moved into Near East South Asia from Sub-Saharan African Affairs in May of 2002. And they, uh, the, the folks in the Middle East office had uh, a shortage of manpower. They had lost some people earlier than they expected. And they uh, had put out a call for volunteers amongst the policy staff. And I did not volunteer, no one volunteered to come work in the Middle East office. So finally they mandated a few folks, and I was one that was uh, basically directed to go over there. And prior to that, I worked in Sub-Saharan African Affairs, uh, not an important uh, area for George Bush. So when the George Bush administration came in, you could kind of call Sub-Saharan African Affairs uh, defense policy a backwater. So I wasn't, had no real concerns about anything going on until I was moved into the Near East South Asia office. And my very first day in the office, um, I sat there with my coworker, who was uh, the Egypt desk, and uh, she explained to me as we were talking about different things, and I, I was probably griping a little bit about, I can't believe I got sent over here and that kind of thing. Uh, and she was saying, well, and this was out of the blue in a sense, um, she said, if you, ha if you have an opinion on the, uh, uh, if you have a pro-Palestinian opinion on the, on the Israel-Palestine issue, uh, this is not the place to bring that up. You keep those opinions to yourself here in this office. And I thought that was strange because my assignment was, um, uh, at that time when I first worked there, was Southern Arabian Gulf. I had Bahrain, Yemen, those, kind of, those countries. And, uh, you know, I, I just didn't think of those as being an issue, where, a place where I would be concerned about Israel and Palestine. It wasn't in our conversation. She brought that up out of the blue, and that was to help me understand the environment that I had just entered into. A very politicized environment, a very pro-Israel environment. There's really nothing wrong with that. I mean, Israel is a military ally of this country. Um, but to be told uh, about a certain political opinion that you should be either hold or otherwise be wary of, that was, that was surprising. And so I would say the very first day I had a sense that some things weren't right. And as I look back, I think part of the reason that, that this person advised me in such a way is that she had already found this out the hard way. And so she's trying to help, help me. So... Um, yeah, that was the first day. Uh, shortly thereafter, other things happened, and my eyes were opened. Uh, I asked coworkers uh, to explain why um, why things were being done in the way they were being done. I was very surprised that we were so far in advanced in the planning for an Iraq war in May of 2002, when I had no sense that there was any planning for a war in Iraq um, prior to that. And, and the, so I asked the folks, and pretty much the conclusion that, uh, or the, the, con the uh, the answer, the, the cumulative answer that I got was that um, the people that make the decisions here are all political appointees, and they're not just regular political appointees, but they're neoconservative political appointees, and there is no debating, and there is no argument, and your job as a staff officer is uh, not to advise. They don't need to want your advice. Your job is to simply do what you're told, and that's what you'll do. And, um, you know, people who aren't in the military may say, well, of course, that's what the military person's job is, and, but it's not really true. In, in, uh, in the Pentagon, when you're a, a staff officer, uh, whether it's a professional civilian or a military officer, your job is to think. You are, you know, we have people at the uh, mid-level and higher-level field grade ranks, and their job is to think and to assess and to advise uh, at a low level, but certainly to advise and to think. And, and we were, I was being told in this office, no. That's not something that is needed. It's not necessary. The people doing the thinking are already, they're not you. They are these other folks. They're political folks. And uh, neoconservative in their viewpoint, um, you're, not, you're not really needed to contribute to this. And it wasn't just me. It was all of us. I mean, these people advising me this were folks that had been there longer than me who had either uh, complained about it or come to terms with it. Uh, 
it's interesting that a number of those folks uh, left the office, um, found ways to have their three-year tour curtailed, uh, moved on to a lateral position if they were a civilian, uh, got a by-name request if they were military into another office so that they could be pulled out. So uh, I don't think that my reaction of uh, concern was, was unique. <laughs> it was not unique at all. Uh, anyone who, who was seeing it with their eyes open around them knew that this is a place uh, you did not want to be. And when you looked at the, both the print and television news media during this time period, you know, what are some of your reactions to what you were seeing from the mm -hmm. inside and what you wish you would have been seeing? Yeah, well, during the summer, uh, of course, the big thing in the summer of 2002 were the famous uh, leaks to the New York Times of uh, PowerPoint slides from Central Command showing the advanced stages and proposals for this invasion of Iraq. And at that point, prior to those leaks, uh, well, particularly the New York Times leak in July, there had been a previous leak that didn't have legs. It didn't have media legs. It didn't go anywhere. To the LA Times, uh, William Arkin had, had done an article which said kind of the same thing, and it didn't go anywhere. So there was a second leak. I'm, I'm insinuating here that this leak was done purposely. My, my, uh, my observation of it was certainly that it was done purposely to kind of generate a national discussion on the doability of an invasion of Iraq and, and to kind of break the ice with the American people that this is where we're going to go next. Um, as I watched this happen uh, and saw the advanced levels of planning for this war in Iraq, almost to the extent that it was a done deal, even as early as May or June of 2002, the sense of it was, yeah, we're going to do this. We just have to get everyone else on board. And the everyone else on board was the media and the American public, because they would have to be behind a war. They would need to have uh, some sense of uh, uh, excitement about this war. That had to be built up. And so it seemed like um, what I was seeing in the media was, as I look back now, was being uh, shaped by the Pentagon. The Pentagon was actually pushing for war. Now, the Pentagon rarely uh, pushes for war. If you remember the Powell, the Powell Doctrine, Weinberger Powell Doctrine, kind of the recuperation from the Vietnam Syndrome, what we, what we said was uh, uh, we would only, the American military would only go to war when there was a clear objective, uh, when there was uh, a, uh, an exit strategy of some kind up front. And we would only go to war when we were able to mobilize with overwhelming strength against whatever that enemy was, based on the objective that we had. And this is the Pal Weinberger doctrine, and it had uh, it was kind of seen as the cure for the problem that Pal, as a young soldier and others, dealt with through Vietnam. So the Pal doctrine was totally not what these guys were going with. I mean, the clear objective. Um, Certainly that Sodom was evil, but everything else was kind of mushy, right? You know, WMDs, what WMDs? They had to wait to the, you know, they had to wait till September 2002 before the CIA would even, could even put together an assessment on WMDs. And that, of course, has since been shown uh, by the Congress to have been full of, full of just uh, really bad intelligence work, number one, and number two, uh, subjected to uh, politicization at, it, at, its, at the higher levels. So... The idea was we need to convince. So here's the Pentagon, or at least the civilians at the Pentagon. Certainly I don't think the military were thinking this up, even at the general, even at the flag officer level. But the civilians at the Pentagon are uh, political appointees, guys like Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld, Doug Fife, uh, our boss Bill Ludi, uh, who served underneath Doug Fife. Um, these guys are saying, how do we drum up a positive rationale for war, a war that we've already planned and are basically ready to do, ready, ready to go do this thing. Um, but we can't do it unless, you know, we, we need to help the president convince the people to do this. First off, that's just um, not something that I had ever seen in 19 years prior. Um, I only worked in the Pentagon for five years, um, but I don't recall during the uh, last, uh, during, during the Clinton years, we did the Bosnia Kosovo thing. We did Operation Deny Flight, which I was I served uh, for a part of my time in, in Aviano there under that mission. And I don't recall military folk pushing for this or that. Um, the only thing I can recall is a certain uh, Air Force general wanted to make sure that he had 
the authorities that he would need to go do things, things like that, operational issues, but not political issues. I didn't, in fact, the military, if anything, was kind of keeping uh, Clinton and his advisors, you know, at length saying, look, let's take this thing slow. Let's kind of uh, make sure that we do this uh, the right way with minimal risk to Americans, that we know what the objective is. And it wasn't a, in a perfect uh, result in any case, but that's how I recall the military behaving. That's how I recall the Pentagon behaving. Not the way I saw them in 2002 with Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz and Fife and these guys basically going out, drumming up support for a war, not ever saying, hey, let's think about this, which is usually the role that the senior uh, commanders in the Pentagon play. They didn't play that role, at least the, the civilians did not. They played the role of war cheerleader, you know, basically. Uh, and, and of course, uh, the intelligence budget, 70% of the intelligence budget, 70 or 80, falls under the Defense Department. And that was also being mobilized to try to build up a sense of uh, public necessity uh, to go in and do do Saddam Hussein. Now, do what to him? It's not clear. We want, I guess we wanted to topple him. Uh, very little discussion uh, was ever held prior to the invasion as to what we really envisioned, other than, uh, I guess, Wolfowitz thought that uh, they would throw candy and flowers. I think that was, there would be parades welcoming the uh, liberating American soldiers, some kind of retro, uh, you know, liberation of France or something. Of course, none of that was realistic. And I don't recall large, uh, widespread American discussion on what it was going to be like afterwards. Uh, they didn't care. The idea was to get Americans behind a war such that we could go do this thing. And uh, I can, my view, which I came to several months uh, after I realized this war was going to happen, it was inevitable. All we were waiting on were the American people to get behind it, which the president and vice president did. They succeeded in that with the help of the Pentagon uh, senior leadership. But once I knew it was going to happen, uh, this, the idea of uh, what would happen, happen afterwards and the very glaring absence of an exit strategy at that time told me that there was no exit strategy. <laughs> there wasn't, we're not talking about an exit strategy because we're not leaving Iraq, which is pretty much clear now. As one of the first things that we've done uh, as soon as we invaded and uh, seized the, the halls of power, basically, was begin work on bases, base building. Um, Halliburton, Kellogg, Brown and Root, Bechtel, these are base construction contracts and that's what they've done and those bases are mostly done now a year, year or so later and we're not leaving those bases they'll, if, if we have to if the whole place falls apart around us there'll be little Guantanamos in the middle of a hostile territory but they'll still be American bases and as I look back in 2002 as I saw this thing happening and I wondered why the PAL doctrine was being so viciously and blatantly ignored, especially given Powell, Powell was over there in the State Department. You'd think he might have some incentive to maybe push for sanity, and I think he did for, for a time. But uh, the Powell Doctrine was ignored because had we applied the Powell Doctrine, there would have been no war in Iraq. Um, first off, there was no clear objective and overwhelming reason. There was no exit strategy. They didn't want an exit strategy. And the idea of using overwhelming force was not something they could sell to the American people. They needed to be able to tell the American people, we can do this. The very small amount of uh, force is a minimal effort, uh, minimal cost to you, Mr. and Mrs. American citizen. So um, uh, it was clear why they rejected, after the fact, it was very clear why they rejected the Powell Doctrine. During the time, uh, I really thought that... Uh, what a lot of people thought, and that this is the neoconservatives rejected the Powell Doctrine because they'd never heard of it. You know, they, they really don't have military experience. Um, uh, these guys uh, are not, uh, most of the people making the policy have very little sensitivity and understanding of what the military is, how it works. Um, their views on world power and balance of power and how to change the world um, are really immature, very immature views, um, like boys that play with toys, you know, you play war games. Um, you're not limited by reality. There's an element of fantasy involved when you play cowboys and Indians. Um, that's what these guys are. That's where they are in their strategic thinking as far as war. Now, at a larger level, uh, the idea that the neoconservatives had of uh, permanently reshaping and changing the Middle East through uh, permanent placement of uh, very, very strategically located bases in Iraq. There's, there's something of good strategy there. If you are okay with lying to get there, which is what they did and what they had to do was to lie to get there. I mean, because they could have told the American people, look, 
uh, the biggest oil fields, uh, certainly the second biggest, but possibly the largest oil fields in the world that we know of are in Iraq. Saddam Hussein is not our friend. We are dependent on oil. China wants this oil 15 years from now. They'd like it now. The only way that we will be able to uh, stay on top, which is what the neoconservatives care about, staying on top, is to uh, occupy Iraq and place our military bases there and basically leverage the rest of the Middle East through this process. Now, that is a, something that we could debate. Sane and, and normal people can discuss this. Is this in our interest? Is it something we can do? And it could, be, it could have been sold to the American people. Most likely, American people would have said, is there a non-war way of getting to the same conclusion? And of course, there are many non-war ways to have gotten to the same place. Um, the neoconservatives did not want that debate, therefore they created, uh, I mean, they created the, the artificial reasons, which we now know, in 2004, we now know that these reasons were almost entirely uh, false, which, which is just an awful thing to think that your government would lie to you in order to uh, take over another country. It's not unprecedented, certainly in their history, you know, that's happened, but um, you'd think in the age of the internet, in modern media, uh, connectivity, you know, global connectivity that we have, you'd think that we couldn't, that the American people could not have had the wool pulled over their eyes so easily, or the Congress itself have the wool pulled over its eyes, and yet it's exactly what happened. So. And do, you, do you fault the media to some extent for not asking why we were doing this? The American media is at fault. Uh, if, you, if you think about the whole, if you think about the media in an interconnected world and you include the international media, uh, it really makes the American media look a lot worse because the international media who uh, are often predisposed to be critical of United States policy, granted, American media shouldn't be predisposed to be critical of our policy, but the, uh, the, the overseas media in their predisposition to question what it was America was doing and in their use of a uh, far wider range of sources, international sources, uh, understood very well and very quickly what was going on in this country. Uh, they understood, the international media. And many, uh, if, if you look back now, you'll find that the same questions that the American media, two years later, are beginning to ask and, and are beginning to say, you know, we really should have asked that question. These questions were being asked in the international media. And folks who are uh, news nuts or people that stay on the internet and read a lot of news and get their sources from more than just domestic media, on, on international subjects, they knew. In fact, that's the core of your uh, criticism that came from academia, that came maybe from some of the left-wing side of the house. These guys were getting information, very valid information, from sources that the American media was pretty much not even uh, uh, including. And, and I don't know if it's reporters or if it's editors, because the editors are the ones who uh, say, I don't want another story like this. I want a story like this. Um, the editor is the one that says, look, if you lose your access to your Pentagon sources, if you lose your access for my uh, media corporation to the White House because of this story or that story, you cost me money. Therefore, I'm advising you as your boss, don't lose my access. And it was very clear that this administration has been effective in uh, holding uh, access to reporters hostage to the kinds of stories that they produce. And if you, if you notice, there's a, a few old, I shouldn't say old, but there's a few independent uh, American uh, broadcasters. And the one I'm thinking of is the, uh, who's the lady, the White House correspondent? Helen and Thomas. Helen Thomas is a prime, <laughs> Helen Thomas is a okay, prime so example. Disturb, disturbing okay, but uh, there's, there's some American uh, reporters who stood up to this kind of thing. And I think a good example of this is Helen Thomas, who reported on, on many, many White Houses. And she um, uh, is one of the few who sets the standard for asking hard questions. Um, I don't know if it's because she is uh, very experienced. Um, I don't know if it's because of her particular views. Um, but whatever it is, she sets an example. And it's an example that many of the uh, baby boomer age reporters, uh, Helen Thomas is far beyond baby boomer age, the, the folks in the generation after her, the baby boomer generation, 45 to 65, these reporters uh, conformed just as, just as that generation has always done. That generation, I'm sorry to say, and I'm the tail end of the baby boom myself, but that generation has conformed consistently and has indulged itself and has never 
uh, really achieved. You know, I think um, we talked about the, we, we haven't talked about it, but the, the idea of a greatest generation, that's a false concept, but the idea that the World War II generation was somehow a very unique and special generation, people that could self-sacrifice, people that could uh, contribute of themselves for the betterment of the country uh, against odds, against, against harsh uh, economic conditions, whatever. This is a false idea that there's some such thing as a greatest generation. However, the baby boomers would never receive that label, okay, because they don't sacrifice and they don't take risks that um, are anything beyond uh, comfort zone risks. And so uh, I think they are the ones that failed. And if you look at the reporters in this country who have, American reporters, who have pushed the envelope, who have asked the hard questions, it's been the ones younger than, this is the X and Y generation reporters, these guys are not conforming. These guys are asking hard questions. Unfortunately, their bosses are the guys in the baby boom generation. So uh, they have some restraints placed on them. But um, to an extent, uh, this whole problem of being sold a, a package of lies in order to go conduct a war for reasons that exist but are still not openly shared, you know, occupation, permanent occupation of Iraq is, is an objective. We haven't talked about that. We haven't really admitted that we intend to be there for 20 years. People, senior military officers have said this, but it hasn't really become part of mainstream thought. But uh, this is a problem that all Americans share in to a certain extent. Um, it's not just the media that didn't ask the questions. It's not just the Congress that didn't do their job. It's not just George Bush and, and Dick Cheney, baby boomers themselves, who are pushing lies, who feel that it's okay to lie to get your way. It's all the rest of Americans who say, you know, I don't really want to rock the boat. And not rocking the boat is, uh, to me, a very clear characteristic of the baby boomer generation. And, you know, we think of them, oh, but they're the ones that marched at the college campuses. But <laughs> most of the people who marched to anti-Vietnam demonstrators went there, like, like we do a lot of things, for the, for the free booze and for the fun and for the, won't this be something different, something entertaining. Um, I don't give them huge credit for, uh, for uh, uh, being independent thinkers. Um, I give them huge credit for following the pack, and that's exactly what we've all done in this country, and that's why we're, we have the situation in Iraq, which we have to live with. We've, we've gone into a country, uh, destroyed its, uh, its uh, infrastructure, destroyed its form of government, not that it was a very good form of government, but it was something that worked, and replaced it with something that is not only very, very corrupt, financially corrupt, the, the folks that we've put in place in, in Iraq are awful, um, crooked people, no better than any of the folks that they had under Saddam Hussein. But also, it doesn't work. <laughs> See, there's some things that are corrupt that actually work. The mafia tends to work. It's sustained itself for a long time. So you can say, well, they're crooked, but they work. Uh, what we have put in Iraq does not work. Uh, it's not only crooked, but it does not work. So we have to live with that. All the dead folks on the Iraqi side, all the dead Americans, maimed Americans, uh, people that are injured psychologically as a result of being put in that situation unnecessarily, all of us in America will live with that. It's not just the media's fault, not just the Congress's fault. Um, it's, it's all of our fault, in a sense, for not standing up and demanding uh, answers and demanding that uh, the rule of law be followed. We, you know, we have a constitution in this country, and the constitution says that, uh, that the Congress declares war, not the president. And the Constitution doesn't really prohibit the Congress from doing what they did, which was to say, whatever you want to do, Mr. President, it's fine with us. But it, 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 by its very nature, discourages that kind of granting of executive authority. And our Congress, of course, ignored that. But the people also ignored that. The people were only too happy in this country to say, uh, oh, yeah, Saddam Hussein is a really bad guy. And we should go do something about him. You know, we should we should uh, finish what we started back in 1991. So all these things, uh, lazy thinking, uh, lazy Americans, and we all are going to pay for that. And when you look at the, the kind of the state of the news media, what you have is reporting events. You know, uh, following the public relations campaign of the Bush administration every mm -hmm. day, they were out there giving little incremental news. They're pushing the story forward. And yes. That's what the beat reporters are focusing on. Now, as yes. an intelligence analyst... Well, I'm, I'm like, not an intelligence or, analyst, but, but a policy analyst. A policy analyst, when you're looking at, you know, events and issues, complex issues sure. over time. Now, when you look at this time period and you look at shifts that are being made, you know, the Bush administration's attitude towards the UN, or can you kind mm -hmm. of elaborate what kind of patterns that you saw uh, within the, uh, 
Bush administration's PR campaign? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly uh, fear-mongering is the biggest characteristic. You know, the, the continual hammering of information, information that we at the time inside the Pentagon knew to be false, false information about uh, uh, the pre the, the, Saddam Hussein's ability to send uh, UAVs with chemical weapons, Saddam Hussein's uh, uh, capabilities. This was something that uh, the military and the intelligence community had looked at for a long time. And uh, so the focus that Sodom was dangerous because of these things didn't ring true to most people watching it. The fact that they continued to hammer this tells me that the objective was not about the truth or even educating people, but the objective was to inspire fear. Um, certainly the linkages back to 911, certainly the, we knew. The Congress has said, oh yeah, there was no relation between 911 and uh, Saddam Hussein. Well, we knew that. The people who watched the intelligence already knew that. Uh, the neocons, of course, didn't believe it, but the rest of us, the body of the intelligence work, um, you know, knew that there was no relationship. And so the fact that Bush and Cheney would continue to make those public statements tells you that what they were doing was pure propaganda. It was really uh, to inspire fear, to uh, kind of uh, tag on to that anxiety that had been generated from 911 in order to uh, gain support for their war. So that was one thing. Now, Bush... Uh, has always had contempt for the United Nations, and so, in a sense, does uh, one of the Republican platforms, in a sense, is this idea that our sovereignty is, is uh, sacrosanct, which it, which it is, and I certainly agree with that. I'm a conservative myself. Um, so Bush made points in treating the UN badly with some of his conservative base, who doesn't like the UN for other reasons. Um, but in, I think it was November, Secretary of State Powell was able to uh, convince George Bush that if he, if he wanted to have a real coalition, not just this fake coalition or coalition of the willing, you know, the odd uh, 20 soldiers here and 20 soldiers here with 150,000 of Americans, you know, that's not quite a coalition. Um, if he wanted anybody beyond Great Britain, that he would need to get some, try to get some support from the United Nations. And uh, he convinced him to go back there. Now, Bush, I think, as a person, I don't know him, of course, um, I don't believe that he really cares what the UN thinks in his heart of hearts, but it is interesting that now that he's defending his position long after the fact, now that the truth is coming out about the lies that were told, that one of the things he says is that, look, the UN wanted us to do this, which, of course, you know, is, is uh, again, rewriting history to make it fit your own, uh, your own needs. Um, but the patterns were very much... Uh, you know, not the patterns that you saw with the Bush administration, it may be normal for governments to do this, but I would see it much more consistent with an advertising campaign, you know, with a product, with marketing. Um, they were basically marketing a product. And that product was, we need to go in and do this war in Iraq. We need to uh, get rid of Saddam Hussein. They didn't say occupy the country. But that they didn't need to, because once we were there with our troops, we would occupy the country, we would build our bases. That was the unsaid part of the deal. But really what they were doing was uh, marketing a product. And I think um, that's very different, I think, than making statesmanlike decisions or conducting the government foreign policy in such a way that it preserves American interests. Um, that's not what they were doing. They were marketing a product. They had this product on the shelf that, that was the, we're going to take over Iraq. Um, we are able to do it, but we need to find out what the customer base looks like. Will they buy this new Coke? <laughs> well, they did buy it for a while. And then after they tasted it, the American people and the media and everybody else has said, oh man, this really sucks. Not good. So, um, but, but it was a marketing campaign, not a uh, governance, not anything that is a mark of governance. Uh, that's that's how it looks to me. And if you were, you know, put your shoes in a journalist, mm -hmm. you know, outside of the information that you were hearing, mm -hmm. but with your kind of background of like looking at these type of patterns, mm -hmm. what would you have uh, done just with the declassified information that was out there? Um, it's it's a hard question. The pressure on American journalists from their uh, media corporations and from their bosses who didn't want to lose access. Uh, was a lot. So there were journalists, American journalists, who, who did try to publish stuff. And I think you've, you've talked to some of them, uh, Jonathan Landay and uh, uh, Warren Strobel at the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, 
Knight Ritter. Ritter. Yeah, Knight Ritter. These guys... Uh, oh, just, just start that segment. Again. Okay. Oh, um, there were some examples of, of American reporters who, uh, within the constraints of their employment, were able and did ask many of these hard questions and expose some of this stuff. And two examples of them are uh, uh, the Knight Ritter reporters, uh, Jonathan Landay and Warren Strobel, who, who I, I know Warren personally. But, uh, and there's others there at Knight Ritter as well who worked closely. Some of them had some good contacts down at Central Command. And so they understood uh, not just what was, was the unclassified information, but also with um, good reporting, actually talking to people in the Pentagon about specific things. They did that, and they reported on it. And if you go back and look at the body of work that uh, the Knight Ritter uh, organization produced, you will see that if only that had been on the front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post, things would have been different. But those things were not on the front page. Knight Ritter's reporting, uh, in fact, I, I believe they've won uh, an award for the level of war reporting that they did, very good stuff. Um, American produced stuff, not, we didn't have to rely on overseas uh, media. But it was not on the front page of the mainstream papers, and it was not being uh, echoed by television news at all, not, not by any of the main uh, ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, certainly not Fox, but even the other media outlets were not pushing this line. So for some reason, and this I don't know because I'm not, I'm not a media person, but for some reason uh, reporting the truth on the Bush-Cheney administration in 2002 was uh, not popular amongst the people that make the decisions as to what we will report. And I don't know exactly why. Um, you know, it's funny, I remember during, uh, during the Clinton administration, there was a huge amount of talk, and I guess you still hear it, about the American media being liberal, being left liberal, democratic in orientation as opposed to Republican. You hear these things, and yet um, Bush and Cheney were Republicans, had a very narrow mandate, if, if any mandate. I mean you know, there was some concerns in the 2000 elections, and you would think that that the so-called liberal American media would have uh, picked up on things that Knight Ritter was doing and said, oh yeah, this is true, here's, here's a fact, here's, here's evidence, uh, here's, what, here's what we know, and yet they didn't do that. Um, so I think there's another question we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean if, is the American media liberal, first off, can you, does, and, and second off, does it matter? If they're all registered, or 90% of them are registered Democrats, and yet they really do whatever the administration, whatever administration, wants them to do in order not to jeopardize their contacts, not to jeopardize their uh, ability to reach audiences, um, then it really doesn't matter what their politics are because effectively they will serve as mouthpieces of the, uh, the current, whatever the administration is. And, and certainly we, we've seen that now. Uh, but, but, you know, it's not just the media. Congress had access to far more information, uh, not all congressmen, but many of the committees had access to far more information about what was going on. Uh, certainly they could call in and did call in people like Paul Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld and ask them hard questions. Uh, they had far more information than even the media did and did a far worse job in uh, trying to... Uh, sorted out and, and to play their role as representatives of the people. And you know, the Congress represents the people who are the parents and the siblings and the family members of soldiers that we sent to Iraq, and, and uh, almost 900 of them are, are, uh, came back in boxes. So, so far, they continue to die. And, and so I think they, they did a really um, criminally poor job in, in, in uh, representing the people and the interests of the people. So, I don't know, it's an awful thing. And when you look at the, uh, you know, I think you, you mentioned these talking points that you're receiving in the Office of Special mm -hmm. Plans. Oh, yeah. And yeah. then when it was on the front page of the New sure. York Times, it was deleted. <laughs> so can you... Uh, yeah. Go? Well, in the fall of, of 2002, the Office of Special Plans was uh, formally split off from where I worked in Near East South Asia to be its own entity. It was still under the same boss, uh, Bill Ludi. But um, they, uh, one of the... the services that they would provide to us, to us, the sister organization, and other staff officers throughout policy, was a, a set of classified talking points that we would include. We were directed to include these talking points in all the papers that we would prepare 
for internal use up the chain to brief various uh, people. So for example, if my uh, civilian boss had a, uh, a meeting with the Moroccan ambassador to chat about what's going on in the world or the region, uh, I would include those talking points from OSP in their entirety. We were directed to use them exactly as they were, completely, don't edit anything, and if you had something that came up two weeks later, don't go use the old ones, call them and get a new set. So I actually received not just a set of OSP talking points, but multiple sets as they evolved over time. And I actually looked at them and read them, which was my mistake really, because um, as I saw what they were saying, they were written in a way that made them sound very believable. But the things that they were saying were not substantiated by intelligence in all cases. Uh, one of the, uh, ex an example of this is uh, one of our talking points from OSP would say, uh, Saddam Hussein seeks, actively seeks uranium in Africa. Well, the intelligence on that said that Saddam Hussein in the late 80s, uh, during the Iran-Iraq war, actively sought you know, uranium and other uh, nuclear-type uh, support materials in Africa, but he hadn't done it during the 90s. He hadn't done anything like that since then. But that's not what the talking point would say. The talking point would gloss over the fact that things have changed and simply indicate that this was an active, ongoing type program. Uh, the talking points would emphasize that um, Saddam Hussein gassed the Kurds. Of course, this is something we talked about. I mean, the media had this frequently. He gasses his own people. Um, and of course, the whole story of the gassing of the Kurds uh, uh, is, uh, yeah, he, he did use some gas. We, we, we actually sold him the, <laughs> the, the materials because at the time we were supplying Iraq in their war against Iran, and Iran also was gassing Kurdish villages on the, the, uh, the border country there. So it wasn't as if uh, the context of that gassing, there's no justification for that, but the context of it in the talking point would be not only did he do it, unprovoked and under no other contextual uh, reasons, but that he was ready to continue to do that. And again, that's false too, because we knew when he had last used his gas against uh, his own citizens or the Kurds and during, this, during the Iran-Iraq war, and it was back in the late 80s, not any time sooner than that. So um, that was another example. They had one of the talking points that ran for a long period of time up through November, and then it was suddenly eliminated, was the Mohammed Atta meeting in Prague. You know, that, the meeting that Mohammed Atta allegedly had in Prague with a, a member of the uh, uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, intelligence uh, organization. Uh, this was reported as if it was a fact, when in fact it was never a confirmed fact. It was a single point of report, denied by the Czechs, denied eventually uh, on the front page of the New York Times by the FBI, who said, well, it didn't happen because we were watching Mohammed Atta and he was here in the States during that same time frame. Therefore, we know that meeting didn't happen because we had eyes on this guy prior to 911. Of course, that's embarrassing for the FBI as well to know that they were watching <laughs> Muhammad Atta. But beside the point, once the New York Times came out with that uh, statement by the FBI and by the American intelligence communities that basically said the Muhammad Atta meeting in Prague did not happen, then it was eliminated from our talking points. Now, the interesting thing is Dick Cheney continues to insist that that meeting happened, which just tells you how behind the power curve Dick Cheney is when it comes to the truth. Um, but the OSP talking points did eliminate, they did respond to the news media to eliminate a very stupid talking point. But there were other stupid talking points that were not exposed by the New York Times, uh, that were not corrected in the public mainstream, should never have been written in our talking points, because certainly the intelligence never backed these things up anyway. But we were still propagandizing our own people through these talking points. This is what you want to say to all of your guests and visitors so that they'll understand why, we, why it is so imperative that we do uh, go into Iraq. So, um, yeah, we saw, I saw these things. And the use of internal talking points to help and guide people is uh, very common in the Pentagon. You know, if you, if you need a legal opinion, you go to the lawyers and you get the legal opinion. But these talking points were uh, largely, I would say, 60% uh, invalid in the sense that what they indicated was not what was substantiated by the intelligence. They were being, and, and the other weird thing is we were told to not draw from them, but to use them in their entirety, because it was clearly a, a method of uh, kind of ensuring that the propaganda storyline through our outlets in the Pentagon continued to be supported. Of course, it was very surprising to me uh, shortly after seeing the first set of talking points when I saw the same things being said by the president 
vice president in speeches and read those same stories in the front page of the New York Times and Washington Post. It seemed to me very clear that, that this set of talking points was not just for us inside the Pentagon, but also being used as part of the public uh, campaign to generate support. And again, that's, uh, that's white propaganda. That's, that's propaganda from the government to the people to convince them of something. And uh, that's not something that uh, is uh, normal, and it's not something that is accepted, and it's certainly not something the Pentagon is supposed to be involved in doing. So can you describe the difference between propaganda and education? Well, education, I think it's, it's, uh, it's pretty clear what education would be. If I was going to educate uh, you, or, or let's say your child, let's say I was a teacher, and I was going to educate your child that, that uh, two plus two is four, except sometimes when it's five. And your son or daughter came home and said, I'm learning a lot in school. Two plus two is four, but then sometimes it can be five. Now, you would respond to that and you would say, well, actually, son, no. <laughs> two plus two is four, and it's always four, and it's never five. Um, your teacher isn't educating you. Your teacher is not. Education is based on fact. Okay? It's based on uh, truthful understanding of the reality that we see. And certainly different people have different perceptions. But education is to give you the grounding so that you can articulate various things, you can understand different perceptions, and you can analyze, and you can think. That's what education does. American people were never being educated by George Bush and Dick Cheney or by Paul Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld or any of these folks that were advocating this war. What they were being uh, done, not education, they were being propagandized. They were being told, here is something awful that you need to be afraid of. I don't want you to think about it or ask any questions. Trust us to solve this problem for you. That's what it is, and that has nothing to do with education. That is, uh, uh, well, propaganda. It has a purpose, and the purpose is to change someone's mind about something. Um, you can propagandize with the truth, obviously, and, and all good propaganda has uh, elements of truth in it. Is Saddam Hussein a bad guy? Yes, Saddam Hussein is a bad, awful guy. It does not follow from that that uh, we would need to do all those things that we did. We don't need to invade his country. We don't need to run his country. We don't need to hand select his follow-up government. We don't need to do these things because he's a bad guy. In fact, it's very illogical that you would do that because there's about 50 guys as bad or worse than Saddam Hussein around the globe. And we certainly don't have the resources to go uh, solve their problem. That's assuming you could even do it through force, which we're seeing in Iraq that you cannot do it through force. You actually, we've actually made things far worse for most Iraqis uh, than, than it was under uh, Hussein's regime, which is an awful thing to think of, to think that we've actually made it worse for these poor people than they had it under Saddam Hussein, but we have. That's, that's the end result. But, um, you know, propaganda is uh, uh, to trying to change your opinion about something. Uh, education is simply to help you think about something. Here are some facts, and here are some strategies on how to deal with these facts, and here are some rules, and you put this all together, and you can come up with, with solutions. And so there's no difference. I mean, there's a huge difference between education and propaganda. Had Americans been educated about uh, the truth about Iraq or the truth about the Middle East, um, what would happen, the situation we would have today is uh, very different than what we have now. First off, I think Americans would be paying far more attention than they do to how the Israel-Palestine question is perceived throughout the Middle East. That's number one. Um, number two, I think Americans would be looking at the various governments in the Middle East, including those that we have allied ourselves with. Uh, we tend to uh, ally ourselves with uh, uh, monarchies and dictators, which certainly Iraq was a dictator that we had allied ourselves with up, up until 1991, actually, when we invaded him. Um, Pakistan, the, the uh, Musharraf in pa Pakistan is another example of the kind of guy, you know, Musharraf in Pakistan uh, conducted a military coup over the elected democratic leader of that country. And we not only failed to strongly condemn that, we immediately stepped up aid to Musharraf after he had done this. And um, so I think if Americans were educated on our Middle East policy, they would uh, not see the need necessarily to go into any of these countries militarily, but they may well see the need to adjust some of our foreign policies that we've had for a long period of time, which uh, don't promote our interests. I mean, if you're going, if you're the country that's seen as backing up corrupt dictatorships and despots and, and old-fashioned monarchies that don't have 
any kind of popularity in their own country. If you're seen as the country that makes this possible, certainly the country that backs up Israel, Israel is perceived by many in the Middle East as being very uh, heavy-handed, of being very careless about the uh, humanity and, and uh, values of, of the Palestinian uh, people and other Arabs. So this is what education would do. Education would, would allow our, uh, eventually allow our foreign policy to be much more rational. Um, but obviously we didn't want education. What we wanted was propaganda. And propaganda is beating the war drums, which they did very, very effectively. Um, and they're still trying to do that, but, it, but Americans have been educated against the will of the administration, but because of the way the Iraq thing has uh, turned out, very ugly, very interminable, uh, very awful. The, some of the stories about uh, Abu Ghraib and other examples of where we're not behaving ourselves in the American standard, or what we like to think of as the American standard. This, is, this has caused education to happen, uh, and that's why Bush is in trouble, of course, this, this time around with the upcoming election. Uh, because Americans have been educated, but they have not been educated because Bush, Cheney, or the administration wanted them to be. They wanted them to be propagandized, uh, and that's what they spent all their time doing in 2002. And can you speak, you know, from your libertarian perspective, your conservative perspective, mm -hmm. how you and other conservatives view the UN, but then mm -hmm. at the same time how Bush is using these resolutions, <laughs> saying we've got to enforce yeah. the national law, <laughs> oh my goodness, while it's crazy. at the same time violating mm -hmm. law. Yeah, it's true. Well, uh, certainly, you know, national sovereignty is a concern. People want their country to be able to make decisions for its country. And there is a fear and a, a concern amongst many conservatives, probably a lot of liberals and uh, certainly libertarians, that we wouldn't want to see an international uh, rule maker impose rules on this country. The, 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 I can't speak for uh, some conservatives, because there are a number of conservatives that are very protectionist oriented and, and they're not really pro-free trade. But a libertarian, uh, libertarian is, is very uh, pro-free commerce, sort of like the Adam Smith kind of thing. We would trade with everyone and be an enemy to no one, that kind of thing. And if you want to uh, have international trade that's free and fair and open, you will pay attention to the interests and needs and desires of all kinds of foreign countries. So it's not that there's a contempt for foreign countries at all. Um, and if foreign countries organize and uh, have a body like the United Nations, the United Nations is easy to criticize because it's uh, you know tends to be a little uh, you know it has problems. It has things. It has some corruption. It has waste of money. It has in some places some places they've done well, but in other places they've done very poorly. Their track record is not strong. So it's easy to criticize the United Nations, but um, for, for libertarians, it's like not an issue. You know, we would, it's, I don't think that they're concerned that the United Nations is in any way going to try to uh, affect a country's sovereignty. Now, the conservatives take a harder look at that. They're, they are concerned that the United Nations, things like the International Criminal Court, will uh, come in and, and uh, impact a country's uh, decisions and sovereignty. And when George Bush uh, uh, speaks and Cheney speak kind of uh, denigratingly of the UN, contemptuously of the UN, that's the audience that in part they're appealing to. You know, the folks that think that the UN is awful and it's just sitting there ready to put its, you know, have its clutches on our, on our constitution and tear our constitution up and tell us what to do. Um, but the overwhelming the driving force behind the Bush administration, and I would say any administration, probably Clinton was the same way, is self-interest. And it is in Bush's self-interest to uh, do a number of things that seem very inconsistent and hypocritical. He says after the fact that we needed to do something about Saddam Hussein in order to restore the honor of the United Nations, because the United Nations had, been, had become ineffectual. That's not necessarily true, but that's one storyline. At the very same time, we have just uh, cut off aid, military assistance and other kinds of aid, to all kinds of countries who refuse to give us an Article 98 exception to the International Criminal Court. And an Article 98 exception means that if um, George Bush or Henry Kissinger, I, he's a great example to use because he's on the wanted list, I guess, of some of these countries. If Henry Kissinger travels to a country and uh, he is then arrested, 
by a citizen's arrest by some other nationality and turned into the International Criminal Court for some case, an Article 98 exception means that that country will not extradite an American citizen to the court or to a, to a third country where the court might be conducting its work. So um, we, we ask for all these things. We don't want international law. Uh, certainly the invasion of Iraq was never justified in any interpretation of international law. It just doesn't make any sense and it's inconsistent with that. Um, but uh, so it's really just a matter of self-interest. Bush uses the UN when it looks like it's something that can justify a sovereign decision or a unilateral decision that he has made. And when it serves his purpose, then he also rejects the UN. Um, you know, I think it's really funny, you know, Bobby Fischer, the Bobby Fischer story, have you followed that at all? Well, Bobby Fischer uh, played chess in Yugoslavia when Yugoslavia was under UN sanctions. And uh, they, the United States said, we don't like that, we want to uphold the honor of the UN. This is back in 92, 93. <coughs> so put out a warrant for Bobby Fischer's arrest for violating sanctions with Yugoslavia because he went and played chess there. And um, he recently was uh, picked up in Japan. I guess he'd been living in Japan and he was at the airport. Japanese picked him up and they're going to extradite him to the United States to face trial. So we're going we're gonna to try Bobby Fischer because he violated UN sanctions back in 92. At the same time, George Bush is not, you know, he's, he's punishing and threatening, or the administration is, all kinds of countries who, who will agree to extradite American citizens who might come under international uh, criminal court proceedings. So it's very much uh, a game of uh, what works for me. And, and that's all I can say. I think uh, truly George Bush, um, you know, he has contempt like many people in America do for the United Nations. But the real thing with George Bush is he has contempt for anyone, including American citizens, who have something uh, different to say, who, who disagree with him. And I think that's very clear with these so-called free speech zones that have been uh, set up. I think it's very interesting, you know, we've, we've gone in this country, uh, how many years, 226 years, at least over 200 years, and we never had a need for a free speech zone. I think most people thought that the whole country was a free speech zone. And uh, now we have free speech zones. If the president goes to a city, if you have a, a, a t-shirt that says something, maybe a pro-carry, pro I don't know, something that doesn't please George Bush, they, they'll relegate you to a free speech zone, which is very strange, very, very strange thing. So uh, I, don't, I think Bush has contempt really for anyone who disagrees with him. And that would include the UN, unless it serves his purpose to use them, which, which he clearly has done. And when you look at, um, at the beginning of March, March 2nd, and then March 9th, the uh, London Observer had reported that you know, Frank Cause of the National Security Agency had mm -hmm. actually ordered the United Kingdom to continue, you know, to, to kick up their, you know, surveillance on the UN. Can you speak to... Oh, uh, I, I know nothing from a first-hand basis of that at all. Um, but yeah, I think uh, one, one way that we look at the UN is as, as an adversary kind of as an entity. Instead of an organization, we actually see it as uh, one more entity, uh, a force to be reckoned with. And, you know, would we spy on them? Yeah, of course we would, and, and I'm sure we're not the only ones. But, uh, yeah, I think it just speaks to the adversarial relationship that um, uh, George Bush has really with um, almost everyone. And that includes Americans. That includes, uh, you know, the, it's funny. Um, to this day, George Bush has yet to attend, uh, or Dick Cheney, a, a funeral, as far as I know. Not a single funeral from soldiers. Uh, he has visited, Bush has visited soldiers in the hospital. Um, you know, he's, he's done that. Uh, but, but he hasn't attended any funerals. The, uh, it's a huge, huge amount of contempt for the average American, uh, for this country, who, is, who has gone ahead, uh, based on the lies that George Bush and Dick Cheney promulgated, um, have gone ahead and said, well, you've, you've told us this, we believe you. Now we discover these things are lies, and yet we still don't see any sense that uh, Bush and Cheney owe anything back to the American people. They don't, it's not like they were owed any sense of more truth. Um, we're not owed a policy change. Certainly we're not seeing any changes in the policy. Um, in fact, I think the latest thing from Bush is that we, we got the wrong country. We should have gone into Iran. So, you know, I mean, there's really no sense that Bush and Cheney are responsive to the uh, 
you know, to the reality, to the reality around them, American people or the international community. We're, he's, they're just not responsive to either one of those two sets. Okay. Um, yeah, it, when you look at uh, where we're at now mm -hmm. uh, and where we want to be with the whole world, mm. world peace, and from a libertarian perspective, <laughs> can you work with other people towards world peace? Or how do we go from where we're at now mm -hmm. to a place where we're all living in peace? Well, um, well, you know, you kind of touched on it with your question about education and propaganda. I think if, uh, if Americans and politicians in, in Washington as a group become more educated on the facts about where conflict comes from, particularly anti-American conflict, obviously, it, it, you know, we're not as concerned with conflict between two third parties that don't affect us. Um, but when it comes to how the world views America, it would be very good for Americans and Congress to recognize where that comes from. And this is not to say that we are self-flagellating Americans, oh, we're so bad, our policies are so bad, and that's why everybody hates us, or, or we're so wealthy, or we use so much gasoline that this is why we're hated. That's not true at all. Um, we have, uh, we're a wonderful country, and the whole world knows it. In fact, um, we have, uh, our doors are being knocked down continually for decades and decades and decades, for hundreds of years, folks coming to this country because they want to be Americans, they want to live in America. So we have uh, a huge strength in what's good about America, but we don't have a good understanding of how, not just how we are perceived overseas, but uh, most Americans have no idea what we're doing overseas. Now, libertarians would tell you, most of the things we're doing overseas, we don't need to be doing. We should stop doing those things. Uh, libertarians will tell you, uh, and some conservatives will tell you, that we don't need 100 or 150 bases around the globe. They'll tell you that we don't need that. Um, you know, libertarians may say, do we really need 13 carrier battle groups? I don't know, but they would ask that question. Uh, most Americans have no idea the presence, the military forward presence that we have around the globe. It's just invisible to them. They don't think, so, so, when, so when they see people from foreign countries or the Middle East that complain, if they see attacks like 911, and we, we said that was uh, Al-Qaeda, Bin Laden had, was behind that, um, they think that this is, there's no reason for that. Why would we be a target? Why would the Twin Towers and the Pentagon be a target? Now, the rest of the world sees it, and they see a target like the Pentagon, and they see that as a very symbolic target against this um, huge uh, military empire that we currently have. That we cur not, that, not that we're growing. We certainly are growing it with these new bases in Iraq and new bases in the Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. We are increasing our global military empire. But most Americans don't even have a clue that we have a global military empire. It's just not something that uh, we talk about or think about. Um, and that's the kind of education that needs to happen. Uh, we we uh, Americans pay uh, a lot of money for their government. From a libertarian's perspective, we pay way too much for far too little. So we would say less government in general. But certainly the average American who's not a libertarian ought to have a real good understanding of the kind of money we spend on the, on the military and what we're actually getting for that. You know, <laughs> one of the things we're finding out with the 911 commission and certainly even before the commission has come out with their report, people knew this. How come four airplanes, four commercial airplanes, could be hijacked in a period of 90-something uh, minutes uh, and nothing happened? And, you know, there was no domestic, uh, significant domestic uh, response to that. And they, one, of the, one of the reports that I read had to do with uh, the number of resources, airplanes, fighter airplanes, that could have gone up to intercept or, or eyeball the situation. We only had like 13 in the whole country. <laughs> we're a very large country with a lot of border. And we only had 13 aircraft that were done. So where is the military defense budget being spent? Well, it's being spent projecting outwards. That's not defense, that's offense. Um, you know, we, we call it the Department of Defense. And everyone thinks that they're defending America. But quite frankly, that's not what they're doing with all those billions of dollars. They're not defending America. 
Uh, we are uh, positioned for a forward battle, a Cold War battle, which has certainly been over with for 15 years, and we have never really uh, downscaled our military and shifted into a true defensive military. We don't have one. Uh, I think uh, what's teaching, you know, we talk about education, what's educating Americans that this is true is this huge, radical, unprecedented call-up that George Bush has done of reservists and guardsmen who are considered truly defensive in nature. And yet we've, he's deployed more of those folks to Iraq than anywhere before. And most of the guys over in Iraq understand they're not defending America. They, they may be doing many different things, but they understand they're not defending America. Uh, of course, we all know that now. Saddam Hussein was no threat to America, so there was no reason to go over there. But um, even the folks that are there now, they, they might be helping Iraqis, they might be shooting Iraqis, but they're not defending America. So um, I think one of the good things that would, would help to have peace in the world, particularly in America, since that's one we control. We are Americans. We, we ought to be able to do our part. Part of our, of our part is to uh, truly uh, maintain, and that may mean downsize, but truly maintain a defensive force, not an offensive force. Quite frankly, right now, we don't have anything that can defend this country. We have, we have an offensive uh, military. It can go and do damage to other countries.